Oh, man. What a win. What a series win for the Brewers. They needed it. We're going to recap the weekend in Philly. You're locked on Brewers. You are locked on Brewers. Your daily Milwaukee Brewers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Man, oh man, what a night on Sunday night baseball last night. The Brewers get a thrilling one to nothing victory to claim the series against the Phillies. Hi, everybody. I'm Dominic Catronio. You are Locked On Brewers, and thanks for making us your first listen of the day. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, more odds, and more lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. There's so many places we got to go with this episode. Look, you win one nothing, you got the win. We can talk about the offense. That's what this episode is going to be a lot about the offense. I get it. You only scored one run. Uh, the weekend didn't really have a great showing of offense aside from. Uh, game two, which was on Saturday, they scored five runs and four of them in one inning. Uh, the runners with scoring position continues to be an issue. But we got to start with the most important point of last night's game and really the most important point of the entire weekend. The pitching is back. And Eric Lauer has become one of the most important arms for the Brewers, not just for the Brewers, in fact, for the National League. What this coaching staff has done with Eric Lauer. I mean, they were praising them. The Sunday night baseball guys were praising the Brewers and praising Eric Lauer, how hard he worked. I mean, look, when that trade went down, you know, with the Padres for him to be acquired, a lot of folks were skeptical. Like, what? why are you going after this guy? Why are you trading Trent Grisham? Why are you getting Luis Urias? And as every day goes by, that trade is looking better and better and better. And last night is another great example of what smart front offices and smart coaching staffs do. They see a player that they think they can fix and they think they have not enough value to them or they're not being utilized properly. And the Brewers understand that. So they go out and make a deal. They see a need and they make a deal. And they make Eric Lauer one of the best pitchers in the National League. And being left-handed, it certainly makes him even better for the needs of this pitching staff, given he's the only lefty in the active starting rotation. Aaron Ashby is the next man up in that regard, and your top prospect is also a lefty in Ethan Small. We talk about the homegrown guys, obviously, with Corbin Burns, Brandon Woodruff. Freddie is technically homegrown, even though he was acquired by a trade. Uh, Ashby is another homegrown guy. Hater acquired by a trade, but in the minor leagues. To have Lauer come into a new organization when he was struggling in San Diego, the numbers weren't great. There were flashes of brilliance, don't get me wrong. I mean, over 50 career starts, but an over four ERA in a pitcher's ballpark certainly sends questions to what's going on. The dude pitched his you-know-what off last night. 13 strikeouts in six shutout innings against maybe the second-best offense in the National League. Second best only to the Dodgers. I mean, that lineup was legit that he just shut down last night. That is a bunch of all-stars, and he holds them to zero runs, just one walk, and 13 strikeouts for a new career high for Eric Lauer. Six innings, five hits, no runs, one walk, 13 Ks. He threw 98 pitches. 66 of them were strikes. The fastball cutter, they had no answer for the fastball cutter combo. The zoom ball was rolling for him in yesterday's game. I mean, this whole game, it looked like, all right, they're just one swing away. And he, when he got out of that fifth inning, bases loaded jam, that's, when he, all right, the Brewers are winning this game somehow, some way. And I think the Phillies felt it. And I think the Brewers felt it too. You just didn't know how it was going to happen. And let, lo and behold, it went to one nothing. But you have to start this episode with Eric Lauer. What a night for the left-hander. So he threw between the cutter and the four-seamer. He threw a total of that pitch 53 times out of his 98 pitches. And he earned 14 of his 17 swings and misses on the four-seamer or the cutter. Look, the slider is good. Don't get me wrong. But the fact that Eric Lauer is a great example of perceived velocity and how it jumps on you, there is something else to him making him better. 
Eric Lauer is off to a great, great start. We have to continue to praise that. Yes, the offense, we're going to get into that in the next segment, is struggling, and he gets a no decision in this. But when you have a guy going out there, despite the fact that you get nothing out of it, right, despite that there's a zero on the board, and he elevates to that challenge, that speaks echoes to that clubhouse to saying, okay, if I'm Eric Lauer, I'm saying, all right, I'm up for the challenge. Don't worry, guys. I'm going to keep it a zero as long as I need to. And he did that last night. What a performance by Eric Lauer. Man, I'm still so just jazzed up about watching great pitching yesterday. And also, we tip the cap to Aaron Nola. Uh, great start for him as well. I mean, this was an ace off. I mean, most other teams would love to have the current version of Eric Lauer. I mean, Nola went seven shutout, only allowed one hit, the loud double by Tyrone Taylor that somehow didn't get out of the ballpark. Only one walk and nine strikeouts for him. And then the fact that Lauer goes six in a scoreless game and the bullpen, the bullpen, three innings without a hit, just one walk by Devin Williams on the first batter he faced. Then they got out of it. They only faced one above the minimum for the final three innings. Hader gets the key one, two, three frame to finish things off. We can talk about Schwarber a little bit later too. Man, this was huge. This is a gut check win. And this is a team that's now 10 and six. And as you wake up this morning, the Brewers are in a virtual tie for first place in the Central. The Cardinals are 9-5. and five, The Brewers are 10-6. and six. Of course, the Cardinals have played two fewer games. And the point of all of this, yes, you're only 16 games in. You're roughly a tenth of the way into the season. But if you put out a grade of this first 16 games, this first tenth of the season, would it be better than a C-? minus? Honestly. If you're grading these first 16 games on the academic scale, they haven't even reached their potential. Maybe this is their offense, and that's the next segment. But it's a C minus? It's a C? You feel like they haven't played their best baseball at all, and yet they are 10 and 6. This is a gritty team, man. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I know it was a, a weird start down in Chicago, but that's way back in the rearview mirror with the way things have gone this second time through the rotation. Uh, great job by the pitching staff and great job by Eric Lauer. Before we get into the offense and addressing the ginormous elephant in the room, of course, I want to tell you about one of our newest sponsors. It's LinkedIn. With spring in the air, it's time of renewal and growth and personally and professionally, and as your small business grows, LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to and faster and for free. Look, I've I've been a LinkedIn MVP. I've been using it for a long time now. I used it back when I was unemployed in 2020, man. like It was a weird time, but LinkedIn really helped me out. They can add your job, and they can add the purple hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so your network can help find the right people to hire. I remember scrolling and see, bam, oh, they're hiring. Apply. Didn't even care. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires and versus leading competitors as well. So LinkedIn jobs wants to help you find the candidates you actually want to talk to and do it faster. Did you know that every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? You can post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on MLB. Again, that's LinkedIn.com slash locked on MLB to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. Okay. There's a giant elephant in the corner of my studio. I'm a little freaked out and it just has a sign that says offense. Okay. The numbers 16 games in are not pretty. I know I talked about it on Friday. Oh, it seems pretty similar. 13 games in yada, yada. I, I, I don't know how much more I can sugarcoat this start. Here are the numbers. A 204 team average, third worst in the National League. A 280 on base percentage. That's sub 300 as a team. Not great. A as a team, a 329 slugging percentage and thus a 609 OPS. The slugging is currently fourth worst in the National League. The OPS is second worst in the National League. You're only ahead of three tanking teams in most of these categories in the Diamondbacks, the Nationals, and the Reds. So also 11 homers, which is tied for the second fewest in the National League. 
where where do we go from this? It, it's obviously it's alarming, and we talk about it last year every day. It feels like oh, when Willie Adamas arrived, the offense got going, and they were a much better team. Well, when let's also address this. When Willie arrived, they went from one of the worst offenses into the National League into a league average modest offense into the National League. And I think that's all Brewers fans are asking for right now. I think all you're trying to see is, you know, an on-base over 300 as a team for sure. But it's just shocking to see a 10 in the win column 16 games in despite having a 609 team OPS. And there are a handful of guys that have got off to ice cold starts here. And particularly for me, the one that really jumps out is Colton Wong. Uh, it, statistically speaking, the first month of the season for him has always been his slowest month of the year. So he's a notorious slow starter. But the fact that Colton Wong is hitting just 170, he's 9 for 53 this year. He's got the two triples and the double. He's only drawn one walk this year, too. He's been aggressive, but a 196 on base percentage for the guy that's your primary leadoff hitter. And also, Rowdy Telez has cooled off. Tyrone Taylor has not performed that great in limited playing time. Granted, he did get his fourth double to tie the team lead last night. Christian Yelich is ice cold again, too. He's hitting 192 at this point, but I, I've said all along, just let the dude play. He needs to elevate the ball, that's for sure. But here's what's most important. The two guys that were brought here to help the offense, they're doing their part. I'm not saying they're doing great, but Andrew McCutcheon and Hunter Renfro are the two best hitters on the team right now, just based on average, 255 and 245. Renfro, a pair of home runs, including one on Saturday against the Phillies. McCutcheon, he's provided a little bit of a spark at the top of the order. He's got four doubles this year, six runs batted in. Uh, he's even got a pair of stolen bases. He's looking for number 200 still in his career. On base isn't great. 306 so far. None of the Brewers really have a great on base. So you, you can't blame McCutcheon and Renfro. It, it goes on everybody else, the fact that they've gotten off to this cold start. And yet you sit here and think, man, they've won 10 games with a 204 team batting average. And this is also, to be fair, not saying he'd make a massive difference, but... I think Luis Urias would be providing a lot more pop at third base than the tandem of Jace Peterson and Mike Brasso, who uh, to this point in the season are a combined seven for 50. So definitely missing we show. He could be back in the next week or two. Um, but let me talk about some of the expected numbers and why there is a reason for optimism for me anyway. And I'm not saying it's going to tear the cover off the ball. And, it's not about the fact that, you know, oh, hard hits don't mean anything if it doesn't mean a hit. You're absolutely right. I understand that. But there has been a little bit of bad luck for the Brewers. And the expected stats and the advanced analytics, this is what we will be looking at. So first and foremost, the Brewers are right in the middle of the pack as far as a team as strikeouts. They, they don't have an exorbitant high or low amount in the National League. So they're right in the middle of the pack. It's not like last year where they were leading far and away in strikeouts as an offense. Walks, they're toward the bottom half of the pack, despite having the fourth lowest chase rate in all of baseball. So kind of simplifying that for a second here. The Brewers are in the bottom half in walks in the National League, yet they're in the top four teams for lowest chase rate, meaning they're not swinging at pitches outside of the zone as an offense. So that kind of scratches your head like, well, what's going on with that? Well, you dig a little deeper. They have the fifth lowest zone swing rate in the National League, meaning when they see a pitch in the zone, they are swinging less often than 10 other teams in the National League. So there's part of the reason why you may not have as many walks as you may think because they're taking too many strikes. And furthermore, they're also the fifth worst team in the National League at swinging at the first pitch, which may shock you given it seems like Andrew McCutcheon is only swinging at the first pitch these days. And yet when he swings at the first pitch and puts it in play, he's hitting 364. When he keeps it fair, Andrew McCutcheon is hitting 364 when he puts the first pitch in play. The Brewers as a team, if they put the first pitch in play and they keep it fair, they're hitting over 290. So this brings it all the way back around for me saying, maybe they just need to get a little more aggressive. 
I know walks and grinding out AB seems to be their identity right now, but maybe the adjustment is getting a little more aggressive because those numbers, the fact that you have a, one of the lowest chase rates, but also one of the lowest zone swing rates and also one of the lowest first pitch swing rates means for one pitchers are comfortable pitching against you. They can get a, get me over strike. They can afford to miss over the middle and knowing most of your team isn't going to try to swing at that first pitch. And secondly, they're just being too patient when they may have the advantage in the count. So that's why it doesn't make sense. The fact that they have in the middle of the pack of strikeouts and in the bottom half of walks, I just want to see maybe a little more aggressive uh, aggression coming here for the Brewers the rest of the year. And as far as the expected average stuff. So if you're not familiar, XBA expected batting average takes your launch angle and your exit velocity and your barrel rate and all that and combines it into a metric that says, Hey, when you put these parameters into your contact, we expect this batting average for what you've provided just based off the numbers of quality of contact. So as a team, their expected batting average is 252, despite having an actual team average of 204. And I'm not saying hitting the ball hard is everything, but it's a lot of things, right? I mean, it, it is so important to hit the ball hard, and that does suggest that there is a little bit of bad luck being involved here. And that XBA, that 252, is right on league average. 251 is league average. So that suggests that there are hits out there that are not dropping right now for the Brewers, or as we saw in Baltimore, homers that are not quite leaving the yard yet and are hitting the top of the wall. Keep that in mind, too. It is only April. The weather is still warming up as we woke up to today here in Milwaukee, right? Can we get rid of fake winter, please? Mark Vaden, I'm begging you, man. But that's my point. There's time. It's April. There is absolutely fair criticism of worries about the offense right now. I understand why Brewers fans are frustrated with the offense right now. It's not going to change overnight. You do have a great game today against the Giants. Luckily, they get to miss Carlos Rodon. But maybe you get back on track against the Pirates. But, oh, by the way, that's another pitcher's ballpark. So don't hit the panic button if the offense isn't popping up in Pittsburgh again, despite their pitching and everything. That, that's a hard place to hit. So that's my little rant about the offense. I understand. I, I don't blame anybody for being worried about the offense because it was the number one pressing issue this offseason. The guys they added have done their job enough. They haven't done a ton, but they've done enough. McCutcheon and Renfro, they're not the reason the offense is struggling. Rowdy has cooled off. Yelich has cooled off. Adamas has been ice cold. Wong has been ice cold. Kane has been ice cold. Let's get a few more games under the belt. Let's revisit this at game like 45, game 50, and see where things look. Okay? Cool. Let's get to your mailbag questions. Before we do that, we're going to praise our friends once again at Built Bar, of course. Here we are. It's almost May. If you're thinking about that beach bod, if you're thinking about headed back out to the warm weather at Lake Michigan, man, we got a tease this weekend, didn't we? Well, Bilt Bar can help you stick to a healthy diet with their 100% covered real chocolate protein bars. 130 calories, just 4 grams of sugar, 17 grams of protein, and only 4 carbs. You can compare that to a candy bar that's 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of carbs. And the flavors are amazing. Mint brownie and coconut almond and white chocolate cookies and cream. They're coming out with new flavors all the time. If they think something might be good, they'll go ahead and make it. And they'll make it delicious. And it will be good for you. You can go to Built.com. You can see their entire lineup. That's Built, B-U-I-L-T.com. You can see their entire lineup of high-protein, low-calorie products. Again, and you can use our promo code at Built, B-U-I-L-T.com. The promo code is LOCKED15, that's LOCKED15, and you're going to get 15% off your order at Built.com. So the mailbag is open, a light one today, but I mean, the number one question was all about the offense, so I think we just spent a whole segment talking about it. I totally understand the concerns, but uh, let's get one of the funny ones out of the way too, and let's talk about Kyle Schwarber. Wow, Kyle Schwarber. I tip my cap to you. Let me let me have a quick aside here about Angel Hernandez. Angel Hernandez had home plate last night. He did not have a great strike zone. 100% fact, he had another bad night at the ballpark. However, when we sit here and say, oh, well, Angel stunk again last night, 
How often does this have to happen? I understand the un- the umpires have a union. And if it's well known that he's the worst umpire in baseball, and he's on national television, the biggest product of the biggest product of the sport being a bad umpire, how does he keep getting these assignments? And it's really frustrating because he's on the same crew as one of the best umpires in the sport, in Jim Wolf. And Jim Wolf had a bad day on Friday too. He's allowed to be human. Jim Wolf had a tough day on Friday. We can all we can all agree on that, but he's normally not like that. Jim Wolf has had multiple game seven assignments in the World Series. He's a great, great umpire. But then you go to Angel Hernandez on Sunday night baseball. What are we doing? So Kyle Schwarber, if you missed it, I don't know how, but go ahead and check social media. Kyle Schwarber went berserk when he struck out looking against Josh Hader in the ninth inning. And of course, Brewer fans are thinking, all right, cool. Should have swung. It was close enough. Look. When you're facing the best closer in baseball and a pitch a good three inches off the corner is called a ball, especially from the left side where it travels away, I completely understand where Kyle Schwarber's coming from. I completely get it. He blew up. He didn't make contact with Angel. He threw the bat away, threw the helmet away, got in his face, got tossed immediately. Girardi tried to defend him. I I didn't catch any post-game sound from him yesterday. I'm sure we'll hear about it more by the time you're listening. But... I, I don't know why Angel continues to get these assignments and what he's trying to prove. And, and I, I feel for him because uh, he is honestly, honest to goodness. And I've met Angel Hernandez and I'm, and a lot of people in baseball feel this same thought. There is something that happens when Angel Hernandez is between the lines because away from the lines in the locker room underneath and underneath the stadium, He is a 10 out of 10 great dude. A great, great human being. Super nice guy. But just something happens in between the line where his performance just doesn't match up with the quality of human that he is. So that's what's really frustrating for all of us in baseball, seeing that happen. So now that that's out of the way, let's get into the actual uh, questions here from the mailbag. Talked about the offense already. Has Rowdy Telez earned everyday first base? Well, if he hasn't already... He's virtually going to get it when the roster goes back down to 26, which, oh, by the way, is in just eight days. So you would imagine when the roster goes down to 26, and as it looks right now, I mean, you're going to lose. Your your pitching staff has to go down to 13 pitchers. And right now you've got 14 pitchers. So it looks like maybe Urania is the odd man out. Maybe Gustave, but Gustave's pitched some good innings. Um, but Keston here, it looks like he's another man out. So, which means you don't have a legit first baseman aside from Jace Peterson and Mike Brasso, who are more of an in a pinch type guys. So in about eight days, I think Rowdy Telez will become the everyday first baseman, regardless if it's a lefty or a righty on the mound. Uh, Keston's been off to a cold start. He's hit some balls hard, but it, it, he needs regular at bats. And if he can hit his way back up to the big league club, you know, let, let's see him do it again. But he's got options remaining. Send him down to AAA, get some ABs, get more reps at first base. And he's deaf. If something happens to Rowdy, he comes right back up. So that, that's the lookout at first base, in my opinion, right now. Speaking of AAA, speaking of defense, talk about Bryce Terang in center field. And this was kind of answered in the thread of questions. So Bryce is playing a little bit of center field right now with Nashville. The Brewers have said, and Jeff Hem, the AAA voice of the of the Nashville Sounds, has said it's just about positional versatility. The Brewers still view him as a middle infielder, specifically a shortstop. But as we know, this is the final year of Lorenzo Cain. Tyrone Taylor is still on this team, slotted to be the center fielder. But if you want to mix things up and get Bryce Terang in center field for a day, so be it. It, it can maybe get him into the lineup sooner as opposed to later. Because, I mean, if his back continues to work the way it has been working so far in his minor league career, he could be here a lot sooner than we think. Maybe not this season, but he could be somebody that is looked upon in a big role next year. He's still only 22 years old. So far this season, he's hitting 288 in AAA Nashville, looking for his first homer in a big ballpark. He's got four doubles and a triple as well. Uh, He's also drawn six walks in 14 games. So he's got time. He's only 22. And uh, first rounder back from uh, 2018. For the Brewers, getting some positional versatility in for him. Speaking of minor leaguers, 
Is there a ballpark number on the cash returns for Dustin Peterson and Jamie Westbrook? Uh, if you missed it this past week, the Brewers made two minor league trades, uh, just trades for cash uh, for some non top 30 prospects. Uh, full disclosure, Jamie Westbrook's one of my best friends. We went to high school together. So uh, we were texting throughout the week and ballpark number on cash on a thing like that. It's kind of informal. Um, that kind of stuff isn't released for a multitude of reasons. Number one, it may not be as much as you think because it could literally be a point of where, hey, you sit down with a guy and say, look, you look at our depth chart, you look at our 40-man roster crunch, you're not part of our picture. So we have traded you to insert team here. That might have been what happened here with Peterson and Westbrook. So there may not be as big of a number as you think. Um, I mean, there are stories in, in the spring training specifically where teams have roster crunches and trying to figure out who's going to go where that players are traded for one dollar. I mean, it, it legitimately happens. There was a great athletic story a couple of years ago. Uh, I forget who wrote it. I think it was centered around the Mariners and the Padres who happen to share a complex in Arizona. Uh, find that on the athletic if you so wish. But it's not as big of a number as you think. Uh, I don't know the actual number, but it's generally a lot lower than you may think. Uh, and then lastly here, as we close out our mailbag Monday there wasn't really a, a mailbag on this, but just talking about the fact that the Brewers, I, this is my mailbag question to Brewers fans. The Brewers just keep winning these close games. How are y'all doing? Are you doing okay? Because it's weird for me being on the media side. You know, it's a stressful moment, obviously. But man, y'all got to be freaking out. I that's awesome. What what a start to the season. So many close games. Nobody has played as many one run games so far as the Brewers have. Uh, that could be a theme. And we saw that last year with the great pitching. The pitching is always going to keep you in it. And I think you ask most teams, would you rather have great pitching or great offense? I think 80 percent of teams would say, oh, I want great pitching because you saw a great example of it last night. When great pitching is on, there is nothing you can do about it. And the Brewers win one nothing. They win the series by two games to one, and they return home today to take on the Giants. So quick preview of today's game. A reminder, this is the reworked schedule from the lockout postponement. So this is the first of two more games to come after this one against the Giants here at American Family Field. Uh, there will be another doubleheader coming up later in the season. But today, it's a first pitch at 5.10, so an odd time. They pushed it back because the Brewers were selected for Sunday Night Baseball. Originally, it was going to be Carlos Rodon for the Giants. Instead, it would be Sam Long. And the reason why this is significant, because you think, all right, cool, we avoid a lefty. Nope. Sam Long, left-handed pitcher. Uh, he's a Californian, originally signed by the Rays back in 2016 out of Sacramento State. Made his big league debut last year. So far, he's pitched in four games. He's made one start. Seems like it's going to be a Johnny Holstaff type day for them because he's only thrown four innings in the entire season. But the good news is Corbin Burns is getting the start on the other side for the Brewers before they hop right back on the Big Bird and head out to Pittsburgh on Tuesday where it'll be uh, another matchup with Mitch Keller against Brandon Woodruff on Tuesday at 535 Central Time. Aaron Ashby will get the start on Wednesday against the Pirates and that'll be against Brian Wilson or Bryce Wilson, excuse me, of the uh, Pirates Thursday at a day game, a Thursday day game early being on the East Coast at 1135. Freddie Peralta uh, against Jose Quintana in that one for the Pirates up ahead. And then on Friday, heading right back home for a huge series, second series of the year with the Cubbies. No starters for that one yet. So imagine that would probably be uh, Adrian Hauser for the Brewers on Friday. That's the look ahead. Giants today. Three with the Pirates Tuesday through Thursday, and then the Cubs come to town for the weekend. Fun Monday episode. Thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. Vinny will be back periodically this week. My name is Dominic Catronio. Back right here tomorrow. And by the way, if you haven't caught it already, just dropped a brand new uh, series on YouTube called In the Hopper, breaking down you know, with stats and advanced numbers and video on our YouTube page. The first episode is all about Trevor Gott, a guy that, well, a lot of folks don't know a lot about. So if you want to carve five and a half minutes out of your day and watch that video and learn something about Trevor Gott, we've got a lot more of those in the pipeline. I hope you enjoy it. If you haven't already, subscribe to our YouTube page, subscribe wherever you get your podcast, 
can go to our YouTube to see that brand new series we're calling In the Hopper to uh, break down what Trevor Gott does well and how he arrived to the Brewers. Again, I'm Dominic Catronio. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, keep on swinging. You are Locked On Brewers, your daily Milwaukee Brewers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.